Hey everybody, welcome to our webinar, How to Transform Compliance into New Revenue. We'll get started in about a minute. Let everybody get a chance to come on in. I see people coming on in as we speak. I recognize some names here. Welcome Cortland, welcome Christian, welcome Daniel, welcome Dr. Clara, George, James, that's great. All right, so you're coming on in and uh, <clears throat> I wanna open with this one thing because you're, you're giving us the most precious thing you can give us, which is your time. And I want to let you know, uh, in fact, we were talking about this in the green room earlier and on practice sessions where we said this is probably one of the most powerful, important webinars we've ever done. And I know, uh, Justin, you were saying the same thing. We're, we're all looking forward to doing this. So you're in the right place. We are going to be talking about three steps to generating investment grade data about how to future-proof upstream sites, talking about this. We're talking about this three-step model that you're getting a preview of here, how to add direct measurement in your designs and minimize future uh, EPA methane taxes, or as we all know, the waste emission charge, WEC fees. So uh, I want to introduce my fellow webinar host here. So we got Kelly Bott, Senior Vice President, Corporate Affairs for Pure West Energy. Jason Oates, a VP, Environmental and Regulatory at Pure West. Justin Slagle, the uh, Senior Consulting Engineer at BRD, or as many of you know, Promax. And David Conley, my co founder and CEO of CleanConnect.ia, and myself, Mark Houston Smith. Actually, that is my real name, Houston, <laughs> uh, co founder <clears throat> and uh, moderator of today's panel. So, I want to kick this off with Pure West. Um, they're um, just full disclosure, they are a Clean Connects client, uh, but I want them to kick this off today and talk about their company and their vision and mission. One. So Kelly, take it away. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for being here. Um, in, in 2021, um, prior, prior to being Pure West, we were Ultra Petroleum. In 2021, we rebranded as Pure West and really decided to lean into this concept of responsibility. So our, our vision is to be the most responsible and profitable Rockies focused natural gas company. And then our mission is to advance modern life by producing natural gas in a safe, environmentally responsible and cost conscious manner. Um, and so we've really worked to develop a culture throughout the company that's really focused on safety, environmental performance, community impact, all of those, all of those type of things that, that really um, lean into that kind of responsibility piece of our, of our vision. Next slide. <laughs> so a little bit about Pure West. We operate in the Upper Green River Basin in Southwest Wyoming. We've got about 3,500 well bores um, and have really been working to consolidate the field since 2014. So, so all of our operated assets are currently in the Pinedale Anacline field. Um, you know, when it comes to the field itself, we, 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 we had a lot going for us in terms of our environmental performance. Um, and I guess, I guess years ago, we would have said we had a lot going against us because we operate in an ozone non-attainment area. We've got class one protected view sheds that, that required us to mitigate our NOx emissions. Um, the ozone with the, with the VOC requirements really got after a lot of the greenhouse gases. Um, of course, we've got sage grouse and pronghorn and, and big game and all of the other um, wildlife resources that we like to read about in the news every single day. Um, but what's what's really come of that and the and the partnerships with the agencies, the Wyoming DEQ, Bureau of Land Management, is we're really proud of, of where we're currently sitting and when it comes to our environmental statistics. In 2022, our subpart W methane intensity rate was 0.06%. Um, with some of the changes that are coming, we know that's going to go up, but we're working really, really hard in um, the MMRV space, the monitoring, measurement, reporting, and verification, so that we can prove what our emissions actually are. Go on to the next slide. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jason to talk a little bit more about those stats. Yeah, so from a company perspective, Pure West definitely is leaning in and uh, you know trying to prove what our performance is and, and looking at different ways of, of measuring that and, and metrics at which we can use 
uh, both benchmarking ourselves against other companies and also pushing uh, to get better regardless of of where those benchmarks are at and, and trying to find that new space that, you know, may or may not be charted yet. Uh, so, you know, being on the forefront of a lot of these different things, have, you know, it's required us to test a lot of different technologies and try a lot of different uh, approaches to different parts of, of, of this process. Um, you know, we have our member of the OGMP 2.0 pledge and, and are working towards that level four, level five. We're in our second year of reporting on that. Uh, you see there, you know, trying to on the monetizing that aspect as well. How do we take these environmental attributes uh, that we are are very proud of and, and spend a lot of effort and resources in, into um, achieving and, and turn that into a, a revenue stream versus a, a cost center? And so working with, uh, you know, Earn DLT and, and some of their blockchain technology, as well as the, the differentiated uh, gas coordinating council, on how we can get the the uh, legislation and the and the uh, the frameworks within our government to to support that as well. So a lot of different work, a lot of different areas, and uh, you know definitely stuff we're proud of. And and partnering with Clean Connect is 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 part of that as well. So yeah, so I try to sum this up. So in, in short, the one two punch is be the most responsible, cleanest Rockies based producer and empirically prove it to regulators, investors, customers, and buyers. Now, <clears throat> Justin or Jason, you've actually mentioned trying a bunch of things. What all did you try, like in terms of technology and certification options, things like that? And one of the beauties of, you know, being a, a fairly, uh, you know, small operator in a, in a, in a uh, contiguous play like the Upper Green River Basin, you know, we have a, a somewhat of a, a laboratory, you know, approach to to where we're at. We we don't have a, a large, expansive asset. It's fairly condensed. And so uh, being able to to try different things in, in a very quick, repetitive pattern, uh, we've, we looked at fence line monitoring. We've done aerial surveys with multiple uh, providers, uh, you know, basically, you know, all the different technologies that, have, have, that you see kind of being proposed. We've we've either evaluated or have piloted in our field and and are, are you know in a in a quick succession to, to try to get you know does it is it effective and and can we use it at scale and and that's where we you know we start to see where there's differentiation and uh, you know issues and 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 some of them you know definitely solve problems but uh, you know they sometimes create others as well and so that you know it's a, there's a lot of different pieces to that technology puzzle. So and one of the Mark, yeah, go if ahead. I can jump back in on that last slide, um, you know, when we first started this journey and, and we were talking about differentiated gas, the market was really all about certification. And so we certified 100% of our production with Project Canary. That was really important to us because it gave us some really valuable insights and feedback for how we can get better. Um, but since that time, the market has really been signaling and voice of the customer, you know, the, the regulatory um, actions coming out of the EPA, everything is moving in the direction of this MMRB concept. And so the market is starting to really reflect that when we start talking about differentiated natural gas. Um, and so it was really, really important for us as that market advances to look at these technologies and find something that works. So probably one of the questions I'm known for is, you know, when we meet with people and say, okay, if you could wave your magic wand, create the perfect world, what would that be? And this is, you know, Jason, you want to talk about this? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we're trying to solve problems across our, our business, uh, both from the HSE side, which is, you know, very front and center with with our culture and our organization. But also, you know, we have we can't ignore where we also, you know, our operations and, and what our our main mission is, you know, is providing the natural gas. So although we want to do it safe and responsibly, uh, you know, getting the gas in the pipe is is you know the focus as well, and and then the 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 back the back side of that is you know where we're coming on with the with the MMRV process that that Kelly mentioned you know and that you see getting adopted you know by the by the uh, DOE and, and the federal government and basically taking the OGMP framework and a, and putting a, a different spin on it and and now we've got this you know what we were looking for is something that was that repeatable we could scale it. Uh, it was available. It existed today, and and we could defend those results and what came out of that uh, fairly easily. This through the data it presented, 
And that makes it a tradable, I think, commodity that we could then um, look to for a revenue stream. So <clears throat> this was a tall order uh, to try to get all this going. So David, um, you know, you lead the, the product team and stuff. And so they conceived of this idea. I don't even know where you came up with the name Minerva, uh, David, <laughs> but <clears throat> all of a sudden he says, hey, I'm creating this persona, this female, this Minerva, the the <laughs> ultimate AI autonomous operator. And <clears throat> the big idea was, let's create a DNA, automate as much as possible so our customers can get their life back. <clears throat> Focus on remote monitoring and management. I came from the IT field, and that's my background um, in corporate enterprise IT. Remote monitoring and management was always something we did. But I remember when I first got in here looking at the Eldar report for a single year for Colorado, <clears throat> 682,000 regulatory callouts. That's 682,000 times someone's getting in a truck, driving out to a site, doing their Eldar with their manual camera, getting back in the truck and driving back. That's a lot of traffic. And that's just Colorado. So how could we, what could we do about that site? <clears throat> Engineering first principles. I know this is huge, David, um, and I know the amount of time that our team has spent with Justin from Promax to really say, okay, <clears throat> forget about the regulations. How would you solve this as chemical engineers, production engineers, um, and, and uh, AI data scientists, then we'll back in the regulations um, afterwards. <clears throat> and then, Minerva, uh, I'm going to let you talk about this next slide because it's really what was born of three years experience trying different systems and, and putting something together, something that would work sure. in all weather conditions and whatnot. And then I know that we've been working really hard on giving Minerva a super fast brain, in this case, you know, an NVIDIA AGX that can run the most number of models and so they can process hundreds of data points at a time. So. Um, I am going to talk about this slide, then we'll get right into uh, the different parts of it. But so Autonomous 365 is our platform. OK, that's our energy AI suite. It has a repeatable, which is one of um, <clears throat> one of Jason's key criteria, repeatable process. It's available and scalable. So we have this M4 monitor, measure, monetize and manage. And I'm going to go through each of these sections as well as each of these boxes. So the, the big it is, to, and so we'll start with monitor here. So step one is, I don't know, David, how did you come up with this idea? When did you decide to do the digital twin? Yes, yeah, so this is just an evolution, right? Natural evolution of, of doing this in real life, right? Um, we skipped a lot of, a lot of, you know, laboratory work as a company, um, the way that we structured kind of our uh, just our way we went to market was, was a hey, production first operations first. How do we make this thing work in real life uh, versus uh, a laboratory or, uh, you know, things like that. So this was just born of, Hey, I need to know my pixels on tar. I need to know from a computer vision standpoint, from a, uh, from a sensitivity standpoint, how far away am I from, you know, leak points, uh, you know? And so, adding you know the spatial data being able to model what the cameras are going to be looking at before we install anything um because infrastructure cost gets expensive right where it's not something we want to do over and over again uh, we want to come in planned full bill of material full site layout know exactly where towers are going exactly what angles they're being installed at um exactly what the tour is going to look like before it exists right and so this was the foundation for the install Right. Um, and as we as we develop this out, um, we obviously have a, a you know a forward thinking thought process around, OK, what else can we do with this? And that's where we sort of, OK, these are now geometric objects. They're now assets inside of a facility that have other sensors tied to them. Right. Others, there's PIs, there's you know, pressures, temperatures, meters that are all happening at this facility. Well, let's bring those in, too. Right. And so that's where we started this concept of this digital mirror where uh, this product's called Luminary, but this digital mirror where we're creating a mixed reality environment where we have both 
that what's happening in the physical world and what's happening in the digital world all kind of displayed in one environment, um, which is, allows us to to really engineer first and then pay for what you need um, to accomplish the goal, to accomplish the success criteria. So for us, it was, you know, we take Jason's wish list and we say, okay, how do we accomplish this? And this is kind of the foundation. This is kind of the spinal cord of Autonomous 365 is this platform here. So, and, you know, step two, we then take the physical camera and we place it on a site. We can upload all that configuration that was done on the digital twin. But tell us about this baby, because you've been working on this a while, David. Uh, yeah. Tell us, yeah. Yeah, so throughout the throughout the engineering process, um, we're obviously using, leveraging off-the-shelf things. We don't, you know, we're not, you know, we were not in this to uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, just, just automate it and just make it better, right? And and so, what we've done here is is taking all the sensors we need to run everything we do um, from from an autonomous inspection standpoint. So gas detection, leak detection, fire smoke, autonomous gate guard, tank level. And we wanted to be able to basically create a hub and spoke model of infrastructure. So. You have a, a mega brain that's inside of this uh, Minerva unit that you're looking at. And then you have spokes that can be taken and placed around the facility um, to, for you know pointed inspections. Hey, I wanna look at this flare 24 seven all the time to run method 22 inspections. Great, so that, that, that bottom sensor is gonna move. It's gonna look at the flare all the time. And we're gonna communicate all that data back to um, there's actually up to four NVIDIA AGX units in this in this one unit, so it's effectively a supercomputer inside of here um, that's all industrial rated. But um, but we wanted the end user to be able to plug it in, turn it on, and be done. Because where we found the you know especially for cost sensitive end users is infrastructure and install cost got really expensive compared comparatively to like software costs, right? And so the total cost of implementation was much higher than we needed it to be. Um, and it wasn't scalable. And this is what we've enabled to make it scalable um, from a, from a, you know, a full field perspective. So uh, that's, that's the, the story behind Minerva. And so then we physically install it at site. And this, you know, again, one of the reasons why before we you get out there and you have to move cameras around physically, very time consuming, but now we know where to place it because of the digital twin. So it can be placed correctly. We can make finer, um, fine tuned tweaks. And then we now see some examples of some detections, right? So here's tanks overpressuring 200 feet away. Here's cold venting at 4 a.m. So it answers the question, this does work day or night, okay? And um, then you'll see another example here of like a loadout. Okay, and the reason I show those three because those are three uh, very common things we see on gas leaks. There are other things we could show you on liquid leaks or tank level and whatnot. But um, so anyway, that's that's step two is you know physically installing the camera. Step three is the system architecture, right? So we connect it to your SCADA system. So we have these cameras; they go through that edge device. <clears throat> it's now uh, included inside the camera, but logically um, it's an edge device we connect it up to mqt or modbus most of our clients want the mqtt that way you can get alerts through your SCADA system we then uh, have promax sitting on the back end so we can get data uh, telemetry data right out of there run it through there run it through our platform so it sees exception data so you can manage by priority or exception you get that dashboard which is where you configure and get your alerts and you can get alerts numerous different ways. Now, um, someone did ask a question in the Q&A about <clears throat> government approval. So that whole monitoring stack, we then took it to Colorado and they have a process called ALT-AIM, the Alternative Approved Instrument Monitoring Method. What we had to do to get that was source level detection, prove it with blind testing. So we got rated at two kilogram per hour at 100 meters. We had to prove Eldar equivalency, that our autonomous Eldar was equivalent to a human being doing monthly OGI inspections, an alternative work practice. We had to have operator endorsements. So PDC and Civitas actually put letters in with the government saying, hey, we will use this and the work practice. And then we got EPA region eight approval. Um, the letter looks like this, but what's important, it says, if you use Clean Connect, 
and their work practice, you can use it to replace regulatory monthly LDAR, AVO inspections, and tank emission monitoring. <clears throat> and that eliminates 92% of the regulatory scheduled callouts. So as I talked about before, 682,000 callouts, we're trying to get trucks off the road, right? Because you can do all this remote monitoring and management. The workflow is an AI detection system. It allows you to diagnose the problem, allows you to have a repair and then to verify the repair was done, to do that bottoms up measured inventory reporting and then use that data to retrain the model. And our goal is to get the cycle speed you know, as quick as possible. This is a snapshot <clears throat> of the dashboard. And in the dashboard, that workflow, it works whether it's gas leaks, liquid leaks, fire and smoke, gate guard, it's the same UI. And you can filter through those things and get all the metadata all the video snapshots or images <clears throat> plot out where the alert came from on a map and so on and so forth. So that is the monitor section and there's a ton of value if that's all you did, but um, that's not where our story ends. So we go now to the measure section. And this is where we actually met yesterday and uh, Pure West, you wanna chime in here about why why Promax? What, what was, how does that mean to you? What does that mean? Yeah, for us, I mean, it was basically wanting to make sure that we we were using something that had credibility. And you see that kind of the third bullet down as to credibility, but it has been accepted by regulation, by regular regulators, um, you know, but as an industry standard, if you look across different ways of, of permitting or uh, reporting, and then being that defensible piece, like we have, we have, the ability to you know trust and also back up what we were claiming as you know our our uh, our performance and that that helped in verifying those measurements. So David, I know you used Promax in your when you were an oil and gas engineer, um, so you're already familiar with it. But talk about why you chose to use it with Clean Connect. Uh, David, you want to. Oh, it looks like you're on mute or something. Anyway, well, while he's figuring out his sound, <laughs> um, I don't. I do know that when we had our chemical engineer working, and and you know she was going through a lot of these things we were doing. Are you are you back? Um, back. That. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, she was mentioning as she was going through these and looking at all the formulas and everything built into the Promax model that she said, hey, by the way, do you know they have this brand new feature called Promax 6.0 data exchange? And if we can connect the live telemetry data coming out of the, the devices back to the model, you can make it live. Therefore, we could get our mass balance out of it. We could get, um, you know, other non fugitive emission data out of it. All this data is sitting in there. Why, why recreate the wheel? And so the more we got into it and the more we're starting to connect with it, um, it's really become a key part of what we do. So, yeah. And Mark, can, can I jump in? I, I just want to add one more thing um, that, that's really important to understand that when we're talking about measurement of our on site emissions, there's a couple of ways that we can do that. What Promax gives us is we're measuring flows, throughputs, temperatures, pressures, all of that is measurement data. We're leveraging the Promax model to build a really a measurement informed bottom up inventory. And then having that Minerva system there is that top down piece. And so, you know, having this measurement informed Promax tool is so incredibly powerful. I just, I just want to make sure that the audience understands that. Yes. So, I'm back. Sorry. About you're that. back. Okay. Analyst. It, I don't know what happened to my headphones. They just, they just went out, but, um, but yes, I echo all the things above. But that's that's that was the key driving factor behind behind it was was typically because one I I trusted it, um, and I think in in a very noisy world, um, you know, I I tend to lean towards Occam's razor, right? The 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 path of least resistance, the most obvious or the most simplest thing, is probably the right thing to do. So. Um, for us, it was for us. The decision was really just around what are we using today, what's the industry standard, and can we just automate that? And that's 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 where we found a lot of success with Promax. 
And I think in iterating too, just that last bullet point there, um, our <clears throat> chief, you know, data scientist, um, director of AI, he, he said, man, I, I can use this to continue his feedback loop to improve our AI machine models by being able to do, as you said, the bottoms up, tops down, the reconciliation in real time, I can use that in the, in the feedback loop. All right, so enough about that. Um, Justin, why don't you explain what the heck is Promax 6.0 Data Exchange? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for all the all the the, the great things you said about Promax. I, I could not have said it better myself. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, a lot of companies, both in the upstream space, midstream space, uh, downstream as well. And what we have found is over the years, typically what you have is you have your your database where you get your da your data from. And that's going to be connected with your plant. And what we find are, are, are the engineers, what they need to do is they need to take screenshots of it or get Excel printouts of it. And then they go and manually type all that stuff in into a Promax model. And then you run the model and you get your results. You get you can run your emissions calculations based on that, which is, which are all based on on. On thermodynamics, they're all physics-based calculations. It's it's generally accepted by pretty much every uh, regulatory agency out there as well. But what we found the the major part that was holding up our our customers was just the data gathering. You know, gathering that data up was taking a lot of time. So we created this tool called the Data Exchange. Uh, and so what it does is it connects Promax with your actual database. In this case, you know, it could be a, a SQL database or a Pi database or whatever, whatever sort of database you work with. But then what we do is we automate it. So no, now there's no longer going to be the gathering the data step, manually entering the data in anymore. What we're doing is we're automating that. So you go straight from your ops historian to your model and then you automatically run your model as well. You could tell Promax to run every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes, every hour, whatever you need to do. And then it automatically takes that data and puts it in another database, which would be your emissions historian down there as well. And then you can take that information and, and send that over to your emissions inventory. You, you can send it, you know, you can inform your 10K that you're going to need to do for all, all the scope one and two regulations. And then you could also even use that for operational decisions. Uh, so everyone's going to be benefiting from it. Operations and emissions, uh, 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 you know, anyone that's calculating emissions, and then also even the regulators. Uh, everyone gets to have the same information based on the same data. And you can go back, repeat the calculations over and over again in order to prove it to any audit that you have as well. And it's all sitting there nice and neatly in the database for you to use whenever you need to. So that's where we fit into all this. These guys have created such an amazing tool and Pure West has been implementing it. And it is such a, uh, uh, like a, it's it's like the the way of the future is, is what we see right now. And uh, Pure West is definitely on the forefront of it, which is pretty exciting to see. And it's not just greenhouse gases, right? I mean, we're talking criteria pollutants, anything that's really of interest to 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 us as we're we're working on mitigation strategies or regulate regulatory compliance, you name it. Exactly. And what Kelly also brought up earlier was that Promax will do these calculations and 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 what you have, you have from the field, you have flow rates, temperatures, pressures typically. And, but what you have with the model at this point is you have all the other information as well. You could calculate anything you want. You can get your mass balance out of it. Uh, you can calculate your heating values of your natural gas. You could calculate your RVP. All the different pieces uh, at every step of the way is available for you so you can report any of it that you want. Right, so, and so, so that becomes part of that next step is, okay, now we take this Promax model that a lot of upstream operators use to get their permits, which is now sitting probably on a hard drive somewhere collecting dust, proverbially. And now we bring that up 
and we have our engineer um, modified to make it as built the site. And now we start connecting the individual IoT devices, mapping those in. And, you know, I, I don't know, David, you have a, this concept of a fidelity score, but as, you know, more devices and more, you know, accurate data that we plug into the model, the higher our fidelity score, things like that. Right. I mean, it's, a, it's an important caveat where you, you, have to under, you have to know the basis of truth, I guess. Um, meters, get, meters need calibrated, right? Um, you know, per, sensors could be reporting correctly, you know? And so there is a concept of some measurements are better than others, um, right? And so we have, we, we're classifying those as, okay, if we're, if we're pulling from the meter, the meter has a proving schedule. We know it's, we know it's going to be calibrated. We know it's going to be proved. Then, okay, that's our point of truth. We're going to use that as a point of truth. And now, we're building all the model based on that basis of truth and then being able to validate that visually with visual evidence that, hey, what the what the Promax model is telling us is the truth or not is is kind of the cherry on top, right? And that's what makes that's what brings that defensibility factor really, really high and that data integrity factor really, really high um, because it's been a black box, right? And it's been um you know, it, it's been uh, very challenging for and 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 so, yeah, us being able to us being able to stick to the basics and provide vi vi video evidence on if something's right or wrong is is kind of the it's kind of the basis. So Fidelity score, yeah, it uses different um, different um, measurement types and rates them. So we have a difference between a meter, a direct meter, and you know a, a a simulation, well, those are going to have two different levels of data integrity to them. That makes sense. Yep. And just to, you know, I've already shown this chart once, but just to say where this fits in, again, we have our cameras going, edge device, SCADA. On the back end of SCADA, we read individual uh, device IDs and telemetry data. Now we have that basis for um, this information. And why this is important, because um, Jason, as you mentioned, MMRV. So for those who aren't familiar with that, this is really the evolution of emissions reporting. So um, OGMP is this concept of level one through five. And what they said is, okay, level three is where the current emission factor subpart W is today. So voluntarily, 75% uh, of the world's production said, you know what, we're going to voluntarily go to level four and five. Level four is source level empirical measurement level five says now reconcile that with the site level so for us looking at level four we knew hey we need to be able to see the source down to the component level and know everything about those sources whether the fugitive emissions or non-fugitive emissions now <clears throat> mmrv takes it the next step says okay to your entrance ticket into mmrv is getting level five and ogmp so then they take it and they turn it into a tradable platform. So you can see this is actually right out of the MMRV framework. And they now say, hey, this is a framework between buyers and sellers. And where we come in, 18 different countries, their government units have come together to say, hey, if you're trading things like LNG, this is the common measurement framework when you're trading between countries or between buyers and sellers, okay? And they've, they've introduced this um, concept of accreditation and what data needs to be there and how it's validated and so on and so forth. So that's why um, we and Pure West have chosen to really uh, focus on helping to automate um, and, you know, in the MMRV standard. So as we've shown you before, we have this computer vision, but now we tie into the IoT devices, okay? And we then connect those all to Promax, and then our AI can then now sort through those, reconcile those, and start to produce in what step six is, which is that real-time source and site level reconciled emissions inventory. And these are just little sampling of things, but you know, down to the equipment groups, the meters, you know, the fugitive sources, you know, through our OGI cameras, the provenance, like the site, when it was produced, 
the time, the well, you know, the throughput, weather conditions, all, all kinds of things are entered into this detailed emissions inventory. Now, <clears throat> what we wanted to also do is not, uh, there's a lot of things that a company like Pure West has to satisfy, a lot of stakeholders, right? State, federal, OGMP, MMRV, buyers, SEC. It's like, how do you do, is there a way to have the, you know, can I produce one inventory that satisfies all? And so that, by the way, that is where the industry is going and that's what we've built, a system that can satisfy all these different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So with that, now that you've got your inventory, you go to the next phase, the monetized phase. And so there we have step seven and eight that we want to show you. So in step seven, uh, there's a number of ways to show this, but I wanted to show you the levels of data because people say, well, am I sharing this data with regulators? Who, what data am I sharing? So we decided to break this down into these six layers. So we have raw camera data or raw IoT data. That's the stuff coming out of your SCADA winner. We have that raw visual data. We have run it through those AI algorithms and we have that reconciled detailed emissions inventory. All this is private to the operator. This stays with the operator all with Pure West in this instance. We have a something that we're working on right now that we'll publicly release next month, but it's our energy PT reporting system. It really is a natural language query system that will grind through that data and put it in the right format for the different stakeholders. So regulatory reporting, like would be um, subpart W and whatnot, as well as climate risk reporting, like the ESG reporting, okay? But then we summarize that data, like a daily amount of throughput, the emissions, whatnot, into a validated energy passport, okay? And uh, in the form of an NFT. So those are the data layers, and that's how we produce the NFT, which is based on this. Now, the good news there is if, and when the audit system comes into place with MMRV, this little passport contains a unique ID that doesn't mean anything, but if they were to provide that key to an auditor, they could go back and look at all that reconciled emissions inventory to validate, yes, this NFT is correct and we can prove it with visual data, okay? Um, so what goes into an NFT, the actual data written in there, all kinds of stuff about the daily production, the reconciled emissions data. It is written on the Ethereum blockchain is stored in the operator's digital wallet, okay? In step eight, we do allow um, buyers and sellers to transact. So sellers can list their NFTs in a marketplace. Buyers can then group those together into a collection and buy them. And the buyers can keep them, resell them, retire them, all that kind of stuff that's in the marketplace. Now, um, this is a little bit, step nine is a little bit of future pacing here, okay? So how will MMRV impact the entire LNG supply chain? Well, as we read about EU and the carbon border adjustment mechanism and their implementation of MMRV, the big ideas are saying, hey, once that you get upstream gas, it goes to midstream, goes to an LNG plant, gets loaded on a ship, gets sent over to Germany, let's say. Now they're going to unload. And they say, hey, can you prove from every molecule going through the supply chain that it had this methane intensity? You can, great, come on in, no tax for you. Um, but if you can't, the whole shipment gets taxed. So you can see why the whole supply chain will eventually be motivated to get all this empirical measurement together. Um, the last part I'm just gonna talk real briefly here, um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but that's our manage section. And that's the part where <clears throat> after millions of OGI leak videos, we kind of categorize them. And, you know, and I go back to David every so often and say, hey, what are we seeing? Like if you were to sum up all these things, he said, well, the occasional cold venting, a pilot light goes out and then, you know, something, um, you know, it starts emitting, right? And so we want to catch those and the operators want to get those fixed as quickly as possible, which is generally speaking, they remotely reboot and get that pile light back on. Tanks overpressuring, that's another big one. And so and the third one, of course, is loadouts. And I show those three examples. So 
all that time we're saying, man, we're seeing these things over and over and over again. Is there any way we could fix these without the operator having to get in a truck and go out to his site? So we partnered up with Cimarron and they have these three components that we're now tying in our system with. So an RMM, a remote monitoring management smart controller, it's called SiteLink, and then a smart combustion uh, controller so that we could literally re reboot it remotely or constantly monitor it for combustion efficiency, which is part of the new rules, right? You wanna hit 98% combustion efficiency and continually monitor it. And number, uh, the last part here, step 12 is a smart VRU, where we can start going, using our AI data, what we see with tanks overpressuring, use that to literally predict when something might overpressure, send a signal to the smart VRU to release some pressure and eliminate the overpressuring. So that sums up our M4 uh, framework. And what I hope we've shown you, and we're gonna open it up for questions now, is how on a single platform, Autonomous 365 can benefit HSE, ops, and help the sustainability group hit their MMRV uh, goals. So with that, uh, questions. I do know that there was one from before. Yeah, um, my question popped up and we kind of just, you know, went through, went through the deck, but I think a detailed answer is, is interesting here. Um, one of them is ZPA technically consider continuous OGI as high frequency scanning under EPA all tech approval, not continuous monitoring. Um, and I think the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, we don't really know yet because because the the portal's not open. Um, but I would agree. I think we would both agree that you know we're effectively scanning a facility, inspecting a facility. You know, seventy to eighty times a day, basically, is what's happening. Uh, the continuous monitoring. And the reason we went that route is because the continuous monitoring had a workflow built in that we didn't necessarily uh we wanted to basically create our own workflow to to allow for remote um you know remote identification or source source level uh with with the continuous monitoring it was okay continuous monitor alarm goes off then you got to send in a ground crew to go validate where your lease coming from which we did not want to do that we wanted to leverage the visual evidence that we already have so that's and, good. And and we kind of went this, we got a little preview of this by doing the alt aim with Colorado, right? Where they, they had seen OGI footage. It was the standard. They all had used handhelds before. So they wanted to see, well, what can you see with this autonomous? So we showed them video after video after video and they could see, oh, okay. Well, if an alert goes off, can you determine the component that was uh, leaking. Yes, you can. Okay, fine. And if you can fix it remotely, fine. Again, they they liked the idea of reducing the callouts, right? Why, why send somebody out if you don't need to? You can clearly see uh, the issue. So, in a way, we kind of qualify as both a component level scanning and a component or screening tool and a component level inspection tool, all sure. remotely. Uh, any other questions? This is, uh, for those that are on right now, this is a very unique opportunity because you can ask, um, you know, Pure West, uh, what they're doing, what they're planning, how it works. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, a theme, I have a question. <laughs> uh, a theme, a theme that we've seen is, you know, the MMRV stuff, the, whether it be a premium or a discount or, you know, whatever happens with, uh, the to you know, tokenization of, of empirical data, whatever, wherever direction that goes, I think we've all discussed that that's really the icing anyway. Um, so, I mean, my question to Kelly and Jason is, is what's the cake, right? Like where, where do you guys see the most benefit? It, it almost, you know, where, did you guys see immediate benefit is one question. And two is where do you see this plugging in um, as, as, as the cake, not just, not just a, a sprinkle of icing that's on top of the cake, I guess is my, is my question. So I'll start by talking about the icing. So, you know, we've all been talking about the differentiated gas market and, and, and getting premiums for these environmental attributes. Um, that is taking off. I mean, we're still at the very early stages. Um, but one of the, I guess, surprises for me, getting, getting this tech installed um, and, and 
probably preaching to the choir here, but, you know, being an environmental, um, in the environmental side of the business, we're typically a cost center. You know, we, we don't bring a lot of um, really great solutions to the table that operations likes to embrace. And so, you know, we had some quick wins and I'll let Jason talk about that with this, um, that really has secured support from our entire company. Um, really excited to see this tech advancing. Yeah, I think the one, you know, for me, the cake, a lot of it is trying to get a, a, a really solid understanding of what our performance actually is. Uh, and without knowing, you know, where we're starting from, you, you know, all these technologies are trying to, they they t they can give you a number, but nothing is calculated, you know, using the the language of the of the process being the mon, you know, each of the the meters and all the things that we're collecting data on, they should inform an overall decision on our overall method of, of calculating what you know our best guess of the of the emission rate is, and that's that's what I think really was the aha moment for me was this now gives us a really confident starting point of saying, okay, here's where we're at and what can we do about it? How do we influence that number? Because I have a lot of confidence in where that number is at from a ProMax model. And, and then the, the, the camera is there to, uh, to confirm that. But I have this number to start off with. And we, we've already seen that. It's like, okay, let's look at how many dehydrators we have running. Can we reduce that number? Can we, you already start to see the continuous uh, improvement loop really starting and, and those those ideas and those things are coming from the operators and from the people in the field that are that are around us now they have something they can see and see the signal you know the the noise the signal process really working where they see the actual you know how do i influence those those uh or have an impact on the on the emissions uh, you know and they those those ideas just start start to flow and, the, and you see the improvements just naturally start to happen sure uh, you got another question. Um, how is Pure West ranking facilities to determine an implementation schedule? Does this technology fit for low production assets? Definitely from the from the aspect of doing the model, and now we're, and then we're using a you know we're, we're working through different methods of of what do we uh, actually monitor from a from a camera scan from a from a from a, a camera perspective. Uh, we're not committing to putting you know a, a camera on every location. We, we're going to leverage hopefully a lot of the AI technology that 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 Clean Connect's bringing forward and saying, you know, now that we know we have all this IoT data and all these monitor or all these meters and all the all the the background information that's going into it, if we see a fugitive, we see a, an action that starts to happen more and more, we can start to be predictive because we can start looking for that same anomaly to start happening in the data on other locations that maybe aren't being uh, monitored, and so. I think we're going to develop, a, a, you know, this this AI or machine learning, however you want to describe it, this process of being able to understand when these multi-layer events happen in the data that something out of the ordinary or an anomaly is about to happen on the on the site. So I, I think we're going to leverage that. You know, we definitely want to put as many cameras out there as we can, but uh, you know, from a from a, a cost and a and a uh, you know economics perspective, it's it's not realistic. Uh, today, so you know, I think we're going to leverage a lot of the other things we know, but uh, you know, maximize where we can. Sure. Hey, J Jason, how about how about when uh, when you're making a new facility? Uh, would is that kind of like a, a no brainer just to put it out there for, for a new facility build? You know, we haven't really gone down that uh, adjustment. You do bring up an interesting, you know, point is is you know how do we you know we could easily get that up to speed and 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 line out a, a process. I think a lot quicker. With a camera and and start to use that system and and it, it doesn't have to be necessarily stationary as well. There's the concept of being able to move the camera, you know, put it out on a site for several months and get an understanding and then be able to move that somewhere else as well. So we could, you know, you could do a, a startup process, I think, and make sure your everything's working like you want it to, and then move it somewhere else. Well. And just to mention this, one thing we are working with um, Pure West and others is this, uh, we've introduced actually a, a lower end camera. And the way this seems to be working out is that, let's say I have a brand new facility, it's high producing, high value, could be like, uh, <clears throat> or high sensitivity, like in Colorado where they require full VOC, you know, if it's close to community in New Mexico. So we produce this high end Minerva Pro. It sees things, it's a full VOC OGI camera, it sees really far, and it can act as a hub. And then we have a lower end unit that we're doing, which we say, if you, 
if you can avoid one call out a month, you can afford this system. That's the price. So it is, uh, we, we made dramatic breakthroughs with the Halo system. Again, this for legacy sites, older type thing, which is what the question was going. Now we have this middle one, which is saying, hey, I need all that, um, I need that packaging that like has the, um, the wind protection with the gimbal, it's running more models, it only needs a methane only camera. So that's that middle thing. So, you know, we have like everything else, the, uh, you know, three tiered system that we see, and, and it's generally how people are categorizing a lot of their sites as well. So we think this fits um, a lot of the sites uh, as they're being done. And it, and it seems very simple, Mark, but you, you bring something, you know, this, it's almost an, another aha moment was the visual confirmation piece uh, you know, when you get an, an alert, being able to go and actually do the the remote uh, triage of that alert, uh, you know, that's one huge aspect. But then also you captured that historically and that goes on the NFT. And so a buyer can also go back and look at the same thing and say, I'm, sh I'm sure that this was produced this way because I have visual proof of that being when it was produced. So, right. Well, and Mark, to your your point about um, you know paying for itself, I mean, I'll, I'll in the interest of full transparency, I'll tattle on ourselves. So, um, so we we identified we have this camera system installed on one of our liquid gathering systems. We identified a tank overflow situation, got out there, we were able to keep it within secondary containment, keep it below reportable thresholds. Um, huge win because if we hadn't had that, it could have been a very costly cleanup. It could have been damaging to the environment, and so you know the. It's kind of a no-brainer when you see, you know, real-world examples like that happening with this program. Awesome. Look, a couple more questions um, coming through. What are what are you doing with all the data once it's in your system for Pure West? Yeah, so, we're right now we're we're in the process of <laughs> of really figuring that out. Uh, you know, understanding how, you know where we need it, how we can use it. Uh, we're we're still pretty early in our in our uh, development or in our adoption. Uh, maturity. So uh, that is a great question. We'll continue to be down that and, and hopefully in a, you know, several months or so we can maybe hop on another webinar and show some success stories around that. Well, we have one, the Kelly just said. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots, but that, that was a cool one. That was, that was just a really fast, um, fast response. And just a, a, everybody was like, oh my gosh, this was a huge win. So. Awesome. Um, have, has Pure West attempted to place this technology on a well pad that is not a tank battery? Yeah, none, none of our locations have, uh, we have liquid gathering uh, facilities within our field. So we don't have tanks on the sites that we've deployed this to. We have two web, two well sites currently that are, uh, have had the longest, uh, you know, deployment of this technology and, and two different vintages. So learning a lot about different types of of production engineering uh, that went into the you know the overall uh, uh, design of these facilities and that that's been a big learning as well as how they how they um, behave differently under different conditions and under different you know with different uh, sources of 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 issues and and things that we need to you know learn from so we have we don't have tanks uh, that we've deployed this on and um, to the to the or I think the the normal uh, definition of a tank. Sure. Um, there's actually a clarification. So Marilyn asked the asked the question on the what are you doing with the data? Now she's following up and says um, asking about the mechanics of alerts slash triaging, but also interesting applications that surface now that you have all this information. So I think she's she's just clarifying. Um, okay. So you're yeah you're you're talking through the you know the the resource constraint aspect of it. I mean the the biggest piece that we've seen and and one of the biggest improvements is. The visual aspect, it, you know, there's, I know it's a, <laughs> it's a cliche to say, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, but truly, uh, you know, trying to look at, at, at uh, whether it's concentration data or things from other types of systems that show you elevated uh, amounts of, of, of methane, let's say, uh, and then trying to, 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 to figure out what's going on behind, you know, what caused that takes far more time than when you get an alert with a camera picture saying here you know here's here's what's happening and you can see a person in the in the in the in the you know in the frame like opening a valve you you automatically know what's going on and it doesn't take any phone calls or anything like that so we've seen a huge decrease in the time required 
Uh, we get them through email and it's on the on the dashboard these alerts and those can be customized to to whoever whether you have a you know a, a operation center or uh you know whoever the users are and we're starting to figure out ways of, of getting those into the right hands and getting those people to react because uh, it's really not worth it if you don't do something about it if it's worth you know taking action on and getting that response time down uh is definitely part of the uh, learning curve and one that we're we're quickly you know i think moving up that curve as we speak. Well, one thing I noticed, Jason, and we were talking about this, you know, before we started was essentially Prove Zero is like a daily emissions inventory. So think about the feedback loop. The old way is I do an annual emissions inventory. It's manual in a spreadsheet and with emission factors, nobody really buys it. Okay, now you get this empirical one on a daily basis, which gives you a feedback loop, say, well, wait a second, if we tweak this or we tweak that, we can actually run it. And you were seeing improvement. Well, we saw the data. It, you were getting improved within days, mm -hmm. knocking down your methane intensity. So, yeah. Well, things that were accepted because it's just, I mean, when you look at it, when you don't have the feedback, like I said, you're not getting that that signal to response you know, you're not understanding the, how the how the two relate to each other. But when you start to see that cause and effect, if I do this on you know on the equipment, or hey, this equipment it maybe isn't running at full capacity. If we if we consolidate it down, we have a, a big gain there. I mean, those types of of conversations are now possible because you you've shortened that that time period between signal to response. Sure. So. Um, so one thing before we go, um, we do have a Prove Zero Early Adopter program of which um, Pure West is is in, as well as two other operators. So collectively, this customer advisory group is helping us really plan out the, the new features of Prove Zero and this sort of uh, real-time emissions inventory. And um, if you're interested in that, you could talk to Mark to me or David, right there is our uh, Mark at cleanconnect.ai and David at cleanconnect.ai. Talk to us. We will send you a brand new Prove Zero white paper that details the entire process. So you kind of got a quick overview today, but it goes in a complete detail about how it all works, trying to be as transparent as possible. And then we'll discuss your situation and see if you're a fit um, for the program. So um, anyway. I got we, one more question before we go. Unless I'm cutting you off. No, no, go for it. Um, so I want to add just had a question for Justin. So so Justin, can you attest a little bit around the the combination of the two? I mean, we've been in meetings obviously before where you talk about the bleeding edge, right? Um and you've and you've you know said, you know, the stuff that you guys are doing is the bleeding, bleeding edge. Can you can you can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? I just, I just want to yeah. take my off a little bit. <laughs> no, 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 I, no I, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do think that, you know, there's, you, you, you can kind of see where the industry is headed a lot of times. And um, I, I definitely think, and I've, I've, I've told this to, to, to many people before. Um, I, I think that Pure West is, is right at the, right at the forefront of all of this. And I think that Clean Connect is as well. Uh, you know, with the uh, having a good understanding of what is needed and how to provide it is is such a big, big piece because so many people know just one little piece really, really, really well. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're bringing it all together into one package. And wow, I think that it is. I, I really do think it is, you know, the, the, the way of the future. And I think that it's the the leading edge technology right now. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't really seen this done anywhere else. Um, and so this is, this is pretty much the only place to go get it. So, and I love being part of it. Awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Well, and, and for those of you behind the scenes, lots and lots of meetings with, uh, with the Promax team and Justin in particular, and they have been so incredibly helpful to build this technology and fitting it together with their software so we're 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 super excited to work with you guys and obviously we 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 bragged on you quite a bit <laughs> yeah yeah no we're we're all happy to be here great okay um it is now the top of the hour uh i appreciate everybody being here if you're interested in uh going to the next step 
at the very least, talking with David or I, getting that Proves Your Why paper, um, you got our emails right there on the screen. And we look forward to talking with you and having you, you know, part of our Proves Your family. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Pure West. And uh, thank you, Justin, for being here and, you know, really, I think, contributing to the overall furthering the overall industry and moving moving the ball forward here. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. See you all later. Bye. 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 Bye.